Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, extremely wordy title uh, for what is, or at least should be, a pretty straightforward process. Uh, for those who don't uh, know us, uh, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm a senior ops person at Catalyst. Uh, I mostly deal with the network, but sometimes I get roped into these infrastructure projects. And I'm Philip. I'm a junior operations developer, also working at Catalyst. Cool. Uh, so we set out to answer this question, uh, and it turned out to be sort of harder than it ought to be. Um, but before we get started, here's sort of your chance for honesty. Who in the room truly and absolutely feels like they could definitively answer this? Uh, so I gave this talk a few months ago at Wellington ISIG. Uh, and, you know, out of a room of uh, similar size to this, only a couple of people really felt like it was something that they could do. Uh, and not all of us can be Ewan McNeil. Um, uh, there's this sort of weird state of affairs where no two people in InfoSec ever really seem like they can agree on anything. Uh, but I think it's pretty fair to say that keeping your host patched has got to be in the, the sort of top five. Uh, and yet, for a lot of people, the answer really looks something like this. Um, and so we want to work out how we answer the question. Um, we've sort of divvied this up into kind of the three pillars that hold up your house of patching uh, uh, and allow you to comprehensively, automatically, and actionably uh, answer the question, assuming you're using Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, but we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so let's get started by taking a look at the, the kind of journey that we've gone on uh, to get to the point where we are today. Uh, Philip and I work for a company which, when looked at in the right light, you could sort of describe as maybe a managed service provider. Uh, primarily, we do software development, um, but the weird thing about developing software is that eventually somebody wants to run that software on a computer. Um, and as a result, we've got thousands of servers. Um, they're split across hundreds of different customers, which means hundreds of different environments. Um, as well as our kind of corporate and infrastructure resources that run the company itself. Um, and because these machines that we look after tend to span, uh, they, they span a really large number of different environments uh, that belong to different customers, and they're used for pretty widely different things. Um, and that means that they tend to get patched in pretty different ways. Um, they've got different schedules that are set by the particular customer uh, as to when they're being patched. Uh, there's different access methods that you need to get into the environment, uh, different deployment mechanisms for putting the patches on, different appetites for how long a system can sit unpatched and what constitutes a serious bug that has to be fixed now. Um, and it, it therefore makes it pretty difficult when you have uh, a, a branded scary vulnerability like Heartbleed or Shellshock or whatever um, to get a really good view across the entire fleet of machines, you know, this thing that has to be patched everywhere, how many machines have actually been patched for it, uh, let alone, you know, everyday common lib tiff bugs that crop up every second week. Um, and yet we consider the kind of ability to say, is this host patched or not, a, a pretty important metric uh, in, a, in an environment, and we think that you should too. Uh, so we didn't come into this entirely unprepared. Um, historically, we used a set of great Perl scripts uh, which parse the email messages that the uh, operating system vendors send out with security advisories, um, which if you've tried to solve this problem before, I'm sure sounds very familiar. Um, Essentially, email advisories and web page lists of things are still the dominant currency of uh, advising people about security bugs in free software projects, uh, and distros are no exception to that. Um, we did, however, have one of the most important pieces of the puzzle already, um, which is we had a full list of every package that was installed on every uh, machine uh, in our responsibility. Uh, and we do that currently with a tool that's been around for a long time. Um, uh, Mike Forbes first talked about it at NZNOG uh, in 2008, uh, and that's a tool called HostInfo. And it definitely could be worse. Uh, if you're in a small uh, environment, um, this is probably the process that you're going through to do your patching. Uh, and it works OK if you have like three or four computers, but even when you've got maybe 10 machines, uh, this process really sucks. 
Uh, and so either way you look at it, <clears throat> trying to get a comprehensive idea across a really large, diverse fleet of machines uh, as to the state of their uh, patching is definitely not as easy uh, as it could have been. We really wanted to be able to generate reports to answer the question uh, automatically and easily so that we could do them frequently um, and without a sort of exorbitant cost involved. Uh, this is really good because when we're patching something like Shellshock, it lets us check multiple times throughout the day to see kind of what our progress is uh, through a particular environment. And it's also just really good because sometimes you want to make sure that a machine hasn't fallen out of its patching schedule. Uh, even if you're not the person doing the patching, it can be good to keep an eye on it and go kind of prod the person who is doing it. Uh, and we have the technology. Uh, it seemed like, from my point of view, we basically had all the pieces that we needed to make reports like this automatically. Uh, we had a list of all the packages that were installed on our hosts. Um, we have a rough idea of uh, what packages are problematic. Um, and it really should be as simple as just doing a kind of set intersection and you know, making a report. Uh, so we had a bit of a look around for existing solutions to the problem. Uh, and it's, it's not that amazing. Um, so when I initially started this project, uh, there were some options available. Landscape is pretty nice. Um, at the time that we started this project back in 2015, um, you had to have Ubuntu Advantage to use it, and that costs over $1,000 per server per year, uh, and it only works with Ubuntu, so that's not super useful. Um, they do have a cheaper offering now. Uh, if you just want their software as a service offering, you can get it for like seven bucks a month per machine. Um, but if you need on-prem, you're back in Ubuntu Advantage territory. Um, Red Hat makes Spacewalk, uh, which is a big Java thing. It only works for Red Hat, so that's no good for us. Uh, and there's this kind of cool project called vFence, uh, but if you dig into its GitHub project, you'll find a really sad message from the developer uh, basically saying, nobody wanted to help, and I got disheartened and gave up. Um, so vFence is out. Uh, so I figured we have most of the info we need. Um, I'll just make a little web application. Uh, we'll present it in a nice way. We'll release it under an open source license, and everything will be great. So I made a GitHub repo in 2015, and I told everyone at work that it would be done in a couple of weeks. Um, so it took about two months of on and off work uh, just to kind of get an idea of how you're supposed to work out whether a Debian package is, is secure or not. Uh, and we're still trying to work that out, um, and Philip will tell you more about that later. Um, let alone build a user interface, shake out the enormous number of edge cases that comes with like 20 years worth of Debian packaging, uh, and then even start to think about how you show that to someone in a way that's useful. Uh, it wasn't until earlier this year um, that we kind of felt like the project was starting to take some sort of usable shape. Um, and so we chucked out, well, I chucked out most of the code um, in May uh, and presented the bits that actually worked at ISIG. Uh, and then fortunately in June, we hired Philip, um, who has gone through and fixed a huge number of bugs in the code that I wrote. Um, so let's take a, a journey through the uh, process that's required to achieve patch reporting nirvana. Uh, pillar one in our house of patching. Um, so let's take another step back and ask another question. Who in the room can truly, with 100% conviction, say that they know exactly what packages are installed on all of their machines? Yeah. <laughs> so there are, there are a bunch of tools for this, and there have been you know, lots of tools uh, in the past. Catalyst has its own thing called Host Info, um, but at the moment, the hippest one by far is OS Query. Um, not everyone wants to run a Perl-based thing that communicates with email and all that sort of stuff. Um, OS Query is a really hip tool, um, which was released by Facebook uh, under an open source license, and it's basically this kind of amazing real-time host instrumentation system. Um, OS Query is really cool, and I could easily give you an entire talk uh, just about OS Query uh, and the interesting stuff that I found that it can do. Um, but we'll just talk a little bit about the things that are actually relevant to this patching stuff. Uh, so OS Query essentially comes in two parts. You've got OS Query I, uh, which 
lets you do ad hoc lookups of stuff that OS Query knows about. Um, it's really good for playing with OS Query, finding out what types of data you might be able to extract out of it, troubleshooting your queries, that kind of thing. Um, it's more of a kind of development tool. Uh, and then you've got the really good bit, which is OS Query D. Uh, and that's the daemon that you install, run on your hosts, um, and have periodically execute queries uh, that find out information about them. Um, so conveniently, OS Query D has a pluggable architecture. Um, you can select plugins which enable the daemon to work out its configuration, uh, and also that tell the daemon where it should send the stuff that it finds out. Um, so we've decided to use the HTTPS API that it has. Um, it's got these three API endpoints. Uh, it's got the enrollment endpoint, uh, which is called the first time that the OS query daemon starts up, where it gets its configuration initially. Um, it's got the configuration endpoint, uh, which it hits to get a list of queries that you want it to run. Uh, and it's got the logger endpoint, which it hits anytime something interesting happens on the host. Um, oh, shoot. Excellent. Um, so we'll just quickly show you a little bit of how OS Query I works, um, because a demo is worth a thousand words, I think. Uh, typing. So this is what the OS Query I user interface looks like. Um, if it seems familiar, it's because they literally copied and pasted the SQLite code base uh, into OS Query. Um, so this is also SQLite's query interface. Um, and what we've got is we've got a series of virtualized SQL tables. Um, so instead of being database tables on disk, these are actually properties about the system that OS Query I is running on. Uh, and so we can start to do some really nice stuff. Um, for instance, we can look at Firefox add-ons. Um, a useful thing to look at you know, that's pretty easy is just to say, tell me about the USB devices that are plugged into this machine right now. Um, and then we can start to do more interesting things where we can start to add conditions, and we can say, tell me all the daemons that are not bound to localhost, for instance, which might be something that you're interested in finding out about. Um, but for our purposes, the thing we're most interested in is this ginormous list of every package that's installed on the machine. And so the great thing about OS Query is that even for a query uh, like select star from packages, where there's a crap load of data in there, you can still say to OS Query, I want to know what the state of this is every 10 seconds. Um, and it's smart enough to say, OK, nothing's changed since last time, so don't send any updates back to the server. Um, it only tells you when something actually changes. Um, it does heaps of other good stuff, but we don't care about it for this. Uh, and so what do you plug OS Query into? Uh, the main downside to it at the moment is that while it's a great piece of maintained free software that's come from Facebook, they just gave us OS Query. They didn't give us the server infrastructure that OS Query talks to at Facebook, uh, which is fair enough, because it's probably really weird and Facebook specific. Um, so if you look around, you'll see that there's a whole load of these existing commercial and free software offerings for software that OS Query can talk to. Um, and they're pretty good. Um, Doorman in particular I like. It's written in Python. Um, and it lets you really easily put things together. Uh, but the problem with these is that they're big, complete, full-on software products. Uh, you need to have Postgres. You need to have Docker. They're not really suitable if you just want to build something with OS Query uh, or you want to experiment with it. Um, and sometimes you just want to you know, try a thing out. Um, and so here's the first of three pieces of uh, code that we're releasing today. Um, it's a 200-line, super minim minimalist Django application that implements the OS Query uh, API. Um, it implements the three basic endpoints, uh, and we bundled it with a really simple demo application that you can use to kind of start playing with OS Query in your environment. Um, and we'll do a demo of that. So here's a live view. Um, this is the, uh, the Django built-in admin system, which is the sort of free UI that you get with your Django projects, um, so you don't have to write any code. 
Uh, you can see I've got a few of my hosts currently reporting in uh, here into uh, OS Query, uh, and they're all alive at the moment, which means that the daemon uh, talked to the server in the last couple of minutes. Um, and what we can do with this demo application is that we can start adding queries um, that we want to run on those hosts. So I've put the uh, select star from USB devices query in uh, that we looked at before. And if we come back here, and now, hilariously, I was going to bring a fake malicious USB stick, um, but I've lost it somewhere in the conference. Uh, so I've, bor <laughs> <laughs> I've borrowed this USB stick from the uh, AV people. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's totally fine. I'm just going to clear the log of all of the crap from me putting my YubiKey in and things like that, which was not supposed to be in there. Uh, and so if I take this USB stick that I found in the parking lot um, and I stick it into my laptop that I'm using here, and then I stall for time to get past the 10-second window where OS Query checks things again, um, you'll see that we now have a log entry saying a USB device was added to this host. Uh, and that didn't take very long at all. So in the next 30 minutes, you could clone this code, stick a thing in there that sends an email when this happens, and then make your security team very happy. <clears throat> so that's how you can get started with OS Query really easy, uh, doing some basic stuff. And if you want a copy of it, you can grab it from one of these URLs. So we have the first pillar in our house of patching Nirvana. Um, and we have to ask the next part of the question. Which packages actually have bugs in them? Uh, and which packages are we going to have to do something about? And this is sort of where it gets less easy. So we started looking at the official information sources that provide by our OS vendors. If you've been in the InfoSec world for a while, you've probably seen a variety of different formats for communicating vulner vulnerability information, such as CVE or OVIL. It's button. Ultimately, the main unit of currency in communicating security risks with a particular distro is usually the security advisory that the distro maintainers publish. The problem with these is that if we start looking at what information we actually get from the OS people versus what they uh, give us, uh, things start to look bad. So Fincham first looked at Debian, his favorite Linux operating system. And here's what they do provide. Uh, the primary source of the advisory information is still in a human-readable uh, email. And while there are a bunch of APIs to look at, None of them quite give all the information we need in a single place. And the worst of all is the advisory team from the Debian, uh, advisories from Debian and what, sorry. The worst of all advisories from Debian are always in terms of the source packages, which doesn't make much sense if you don't install a source package. So you can't use, so you can't use that to, uh, sorry. So you can't use that to reconcile which packages you need updating. You have to work out which binary packages come from each source package. And there isn't an easy API for that either. More on that in a little bit. <laughs> At least things are a little bit better on the Ubuntu side, where we just get a giant JSON file containing all of the affected advisories and all the affected packages on each advisory. Let's take a close look at the situation with Debian and see what the best process we've come up with for working out machine-readable advisory data. This is what it more or less looks like. Basically, we grab an RDF file from the Debian website, which if you don't know how RDF works, it's kind of worse XML that contains only the last 25 advisories and only partial data, things like truncated sentences. Then we take a full copy of the repository metadata from the security repository, since it specifies for every binary package which source package created it. So we invert that mapping to produce which source packages create which binary packages. And then we, uh, then we, oh, whoops. 
then we plan a subversion repository that the Debian uh, security team uses to coordinate the work, and we pass the file with a custom file parser that lists the advisory metadata. But if the advisor is not in the current version of, a, or of the package, instead of using the information we gathered back in step four, we now have to go to a different API that's in a different uh, format entirely. And then we mash all the metadata back into our database. By comparison, Ubuntu is a bit simpler. We download a roughly 50 megabyte JSON file that contains a list of all the advisories, and we just load in any of them that we haven't seen before. It would be great if Debian had something similar to this, but as far as we know, it doesn't exist yet. The thing two of three that we're releasing today is another Django app that handles the job of collecting and parsing Debian and Ubuntu advisory data. Uh, Michael has also built a basic UI to let you explore the data, and we'll do a quick demo of that now. Uh, yep, so if anybody wants to play along at home, this one's public. You can jump in there and have a look at stuff. Um, just put this back into mirror mode. Uh, so the URL is just tools.hotplate.co.nz slash advisories slash. Um, and this is just giving a read-only view um, into the information that we're able to pull out of uh, Debian and Ubuntu advisories. Um, you can probably explore this yourself. It's all relatively uh, straightforward how it works. You can look at a particular advisory. You can get all the metadata that we were provided with or that we were able to scrape up. Um, you can get a list of the source packages. More usefully, you can get a list of the binary packages and the versions, um, and then it gives you a kind of optimistic command that you might run on a machine to fix it. Um, we also let you look at it in terms of CVEs, which is quite interesting. Uh, you can look at which vendors have patched which CVEs and in what advisories. It's a little bit misleading. It makes it look like Debian are overachievers. Um, but in fact, Ubuntu don't issue advisories for nearly as many things as Debian does. Um, so that's available at this URL. If anybody wants to have a look at it, they can. Or even better, go get the source code, download it, install it yourself. Which brings us to pillar number three on our house of patching nirvana. How do we actually compute the intersection of the two pieces of information that we've just showed you? And how do we present that to someone in a way that's actually useful to them? Um, so I had a bit of a go at this. Um, Unsurprisingly, once you run the numbers, uh, the performance is not that great. Uh, if you've got, say, 3,000 hosts and maybe 600 to 800 packages on each one, uh, trying to calculate the intersection of that data and the packages that are listed in a particular advisory, which might be, say, 20 packages, um, is actually kind of time consuming. Uh, it's way too slow to do during page rendering uh, in a web application, uh, and it gets worse as you scale it up. Um, interestingly, if you look at Canonical's blog, um, they ran into the exact same problem in 2015 with Landscape. Um, Canonical has a really complicated solution to this involving Go and compilers and optimizations. Um, we did a much, much simpler thing. Um, we spent a lot of time messing around trying to implement caching layers and all kinds of complicated things, but ultimately you can't get past the fact that it's just sort of a slow process. The solution we came up was, was pretty simple, really. When new information comes in at import time, when I mean, a new advisory or when a package gets updated on a host, we just check and store if it has any problems associated with it. This happens in the background during the import. So uh, when a page loads, it just has to do a simple lookup. Yep. Next step we have, next step once we have the database table, what did I do? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I did a bad thing. Uh, 
is how we actually present the data in a useful format. This is something we're still actively working on. We've tried a few different experiments and spent some time working with the people that use it and gotten uh, feedback from them. One of the main things that, it's come, that has come out of that is actually the UI is quite specific to our environment in Catalyst where the tool is used. Uh, one of the, the other big things that we've also learned from this process is that you really have to try and collapse down the number of different patching policies that you have across your environment. Um, if you've got like 200 different ways that a thing gets patched, uh, it's a lot more complicated to try and rectify in a machine readable way whether that policy is actually being adhered to. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is say, OK, we'll have a machine readable expression for the patching policies themselves, um, so, and we'll have fewer of them. Uh, that way you can kind of automatically evaluate a pass or fail uh, on a particular host or group of hosts. Uh, the internal name at Catalyst for this project has been Patch Friend, um, and that's the kind of place that we're doing the UI development um, and stuff that's really specific to Catalyst. Um, we're not going to be releasing the code for that today because, as Philip said, it's kind of weirdly specific to the way we do things now. Um, but we did make some screenshots, uh, so we'll kind of take you through um, some of the ways that we're trying to present the information uh, to make it useful. So this is the advisory list view. It's, it's got, as you can see, it's upstream ID, a short one-line description, which Debian isn't particularly verbose with, the OS, list of source packages, and when it was issued, and a progress bar, which shows list of hosts, uh, how many hosts haven't been patched yet versus how many have been patched, which is useful for uh, working out how long it will take to fix an advisory. The, pa the progress bar thing's great. It's like gamifying patching. You just try and get the progress bar to go across as quickly as possible, and you know you're secure. This is an advisory DLV for Debian, which it's pretty similar to advisory feeds, I think. Uh, it's got description, progress, list of source packages, binary packages, update command, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and we would normally list the affected hosts down the bottom, but you don't get to see that. Uh, by comparison, Ubuntu is very similar. It's got more detailed description and required action after you upgrade all the packages such as rebooting the system. Um, here's the detail view for host list. Um, so this lets us filter all the hosts that are in our environment by a particular customer um, or a particular other attribute of the machine. Um, this is pretty handy because you can get a real quick look at whether there are any machines that have you know, outstanding patches that need to be applied, um, and also how many packages have actually been fixed uh, on that machine. Um, and so this is the kind of host detail view, which has turned out to be really useful as well. Um, it gives us a, an overview of uh, patches that are pending on the host, um, but perhaps more interestingly, it actually gives us a real-time log of when things were fixed. Um, and this is really great when you have situations like uh, Drupal vulnerability, where we know that the vulnerability was issued at this time, and then 12 hours later, someone scanned the entire internet and pwned every single Drupal instance. Um, it lets us go and say, well, did we fix it before that happened? Um, and that's been really valuable. Um, so we're not releasing the code for it. But we are releasing a thing that resembles Patch Friend. Um, so this is a kind of evolution of the stuff that I presented at ISIG. Um, it's got the last six months worth of good work that Philip's done rolled back into it, uh, and it gives you the base where you could start to build a thing like Patch Friend for your own environment. Um, and that's the final piece of code that we're going to be releasing today. So I'm now going to try and do a full demo of all of the stuff that we've talked about, the real-time host instrumentation, the advisory uh, parsing, um, advisory metadata parsing, and then the reporting um, in real time. So let's have a go. Uh, so here I'm logged into one of my actual production machines that are on the internet. Um, this machine is currently fully patched up, um, but you'll see that sitting in my home directory here, I've got a Git package from three months ago. Uh, there's subsequently been an advisory issued about Git, so this is an unsafe Git package, um, and it would be very dangerous for me to do this. Uh, 
Uh, you'll see that the package there warns me that I'm actually downgrading the git package. Uh, don't worry, this is actually a super harmless bug in git. Um, it's like a code execution or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So we can see now that the version of the git package that's installed on the system is now out of step with all the other git stuff that's on here, uh, which means we have successfully downgraded it. Um, if we jump over into the application that we're releasing today, and we come into the hosts view, uh, we can see that AKLB is the host that we were on. We can see it's alive, thank goodness, which means OS Query is still running and uploading stuff uh, into the environment. And now, hopefully, if we go into this problems table, we'll see that we have a new problem now in our environment, uh, which is that on host AKLB, according to advisory DSA 3984-1, the Git package at this version is not safe to have installed anymore. So along comes our people who do the patching in our environment, which is me. And we say, oh, there's something wrong with this machine. We'd better quickly do uh, an apt dist upgrade to bring it up to the latest. Um, so it's noticed that the Git package is out of date. We pull in version deb 9 u2, ignore the service restart because it's not relevant. Come back in here, you can see that now deb 9 u2 is installed, which matches along with the other rest of the Git stuff. We stall for time a little bit more to give OS Query a bit of a chance to actually notice that and upload it to the server. And then when we come back into our demo environment, you'll see that the problem is now fixed. Um, so that's combining all of the pieces of the information that we've showed you today, uh, and this code is now available uh, on our website for you to download and start to build other interesting things with. Wait, I didn't put this back in presenter mode. <laughs> Uh, and here's where you can get a copy from. Uh, so where to next? We want to try and compute some useful metrics about stuff. There's all kinds of exciting numbers that you can start to pull out of this um, once you have the information kind of in a machine-readable form. Um, we want to know about things like the burn rate uh, for bugs. We want to be able to say, what's the vulnerability that currently has the biggest impact across these several thousand machines? We want to know, what's our average time to fix a problem? Are we doing it quickly enough? Um, what package has had the most advisories issued for it? It's the Linux kernel. Um, that kind of stuff. If you actually go and look at that code, um, you'll see that we haven't packaged it very well. Well, I haven't packaged it very well. Um, so we kind of need to improve the code packaging. We're trying to split out the various parts of this um, to make them a bit more reusable. Um, so that's something that we're going to be working on. Uh, and we want to try adding more distros. Um, but unsurprisingly, basically all the other distros are not on the machine-readable advisory bandwagon yet either. Um, I think we're going to have a go at Arch next. And of course, there are always more bugs in edge cases to be fixed. Um, so that's our talk. Um, thanks for sitting through it. Do we have time to take questions, Scooch? All right, so any questions? There you go. Uh, Brian. Uh, it sounds like a good idea. Um, yeah, so OS Query is written in C and it runs as root. So um, run it under AppArmor or SE Linux or anything. Um, it, you don't actually have to run it as root, uh, but more of the cool stuff that it does needs root. So. Um, yeah, let me just show you, get back to the one slide we have on this. Um, so basically, the daemon that we've written is just a Django app that has three URLs that it implements. Um, OS Query hits two of them at startup time to get its configuration and to enroll itself. And then it just pings a single URL every time it notices something interesting to report. Um, we've also got it set up here to just ping us once every 60 seconds as well, so we know the nodes are live. Um, but yeah, it's just, an, it's just a single HTTPS outbound connection from OS Query into the controller.
Uh, yes, yeah, so it would be nice if Patch Friend not only knew about all the problems but also solved them for us as well. Um, so no, um, that's a thing you could do in our environment. It's it tends to be a whole there's a whole like approval process that you have to go through for every new package, and so we couldn't really do that. I I would love if there was just like a press button solve problem. To be honest, if you've got any kind of um, orchestration framework. You can do that. OS query is nice in that it is very avowedly read-only. You can't easily make the OS query daemon do stuff to the machine, um, which is good for a security tool. But it does mean you have to do that out of band. Uh, I think it's definitely useful in an environment where you do have restrictions on your patching process. So most of those policies are driven by our customers because they've got a you know a staging environment and a UAT environment and a patch has to kind of make its way through those to make sure it's compatible with the application. Um, I definitely think this tool is still useful uh, in other environments just as a kind of backstop because um, I don't know if you've run unattended upgrades on a large number of boxes, but it's surprisingly unreliable. At, like It just decides that, oh, the package has got into a state that we can't deal with, give up this host and never update it again. Um, and so it's still pretty useful to have as a kind of backstop, even if you don't use it as part of your kind of patching driving process. All right, if anyone has any more questions, just come harass us later, I guess. But thank you. Thank you.